Today, we're talking about this absolutely unhinged young thug trial, and you, you need to watch this even if you are unfamiliar. It is wild, and the impact it could have is huge and unexpected. Also, Sports Illustrated got caught writing articles by AI writers. Taylor Swift dominations continued. We're talking about all that and so much more on today's brand new Philip DeFranco show. You daily dive into the news, so just make sure you hit that like button, otherwise it will punch you in the throat, and let's jump into it. Starting with... Let's talk about Young Thug's criminal trial and this whole situation, because even if you're unfamiliar with him, it is a wild ride. Right, so if you don't know him, he's 32-year-old Jeffrey Williams, more commonly known as Young Thug, and he is a legendary Atlanta rapper who launched himself from a life of poverty into one of massive stardom over a decade, earning three number one albums on the Billboard chart, collaborating with the likes of Drake, Future, Kanye West, and Travis Scott. But last year, his blossoming career was suddenly cut short, with a grand jury indicting him and many other defendants on charges of criminal racketeering gang conspiracy, and several gun charges. And this because according to prosecutors, Young Thug spearheaded a violent street gang known as YSL, or Young Slime Life, which they say is a local subset of the Bloods. And allegedly, he ordered and oversaw crimes including murder, attempted murder, armed robbery, witness intimidation, and drug deal. But Young Thug has pled not guilty to all of the charges alongside five other co-defendants. And this notably with them being the only holdouts after the initial pool of 27 co-defendants got whittled down by guilty pleas and severed cases. Now in his defense, Young Thug claims that YSL is merely his record label, Young Stoner Life Records, with using a gangster image in its music and videos because of tough life circumstances and because that's just what sells. His lawyer is also arguing that he was just too busy filming music videos, performing concerts, and earning money to actually lead a street gang. But there, even if he didn't commit the crimes himself, prosecutors argue that the gang members did them in service of Young Thug and did so with his approval. Right, like in one incident, YSL members allegedly shot at Lil Wayne's tour bus while he was in town just to assert their dominance. In another, YSL members allegedly asked Young Thug for approval to stab rival YFN Lucci in jail. But really, at the trial's heart is the 2015 drive-by shooting of Donovan Thomas. Thomas Jr. known as Nut or Big Nut. Because as well as having ties to artists like YFN Lucci and Rich Homie Quan, Thomas was allegedly a high-ranking member of another blood subset known as the Englewood family. And his death sparked a gang war that prosecutors say led to more than 50 violent encounters. And these prosecutors claim that Young Thug helped arrange the killing, renting the car that was used in the drive-by, and then gave the shooters cash and directions to lay low. And part of the reason we're talking about this today is that the trial has finally begun. And apparently one of the reasons it took so long to get to this point is that this is expected to last several months, so few jurors were actually willing to sit through it. But then also things were delayed by a series of very weird shenanigans, let's call it. Like, for example, a court deputy was arrested for an alleged romantic relationship with a defendant, or one of Young Thug's co-defendants apparently passed him a contraband baggie of Percocet pills in the courtroom on camera right in front of bailiffs. Then another defendant was allegedly found to have marijuana hidden in a second pair of underwear. One of the defense lawyers was also arrested for possession of more prescription drugs. And then he tried to toss his phone to another defense attorney so it wouldn't be subject to a search in jail, but he missed and hit a deputy instead. And that also landing him another charge for assaulting an officer, though that was later drop. Also, if you thought I was done, I am not. A potential juror was sentenced to three days in jail for filming the court proceedings on her cell phone. The judge also ordered a potential juror who didn't show up for a court appearance to write a 30-page essay as punishment. He also ordered a tardy lawyer to buy everyone lunch from a nearby strip club. And so after 567 days of just absolute nonsense like that, the jury was selected and the trial finally kicked off on Monday. With a panel of 12 jurors reportedly including seven black women, two black men, two white women, and one white man. And if he's convicted on all charges, Young Thug could face up to a 120 years in prison. So the stakes here, extremely high, and already we're seeing the trials off to a rocky start. With the defense complaining that the prosecutors had wrongly shifted the burden of proof in their opening statement, making it seem like the defendants would have to prove their innocence. Then you have the defense accusing prosecutors of showing the jury evidence that was banned from the case, with Young Thug's lawyer asking the judge for a mistrial request that was ultimately denied, though the judge did reprimand the prosecutors. Also, we should get to the actual arguments of the case, because a huge sticking point in this trial is the use of YSL's rap lyrics as evidence, or because the label's music often contains references to drugs and describes acts of violence and other criminal activity that prosecutors argue is connected to real events. For example, Young Thug's song Slime Shit talks about 100 rounds in Tahoe, a line that supposedly refers to Donovan's killing in a Chevy Tahoe. But there you had Young Thug's lawyer arguing that he rapped about various cars often and there was no evidence of when that lyric was even created. But also, notably there, it wasn't just the lawyers, but many people in the music industry, fans and activists who have criticized the use of song lyrics in this way. And they're arguing that it's not just a violation of the artist's First Amendment rights, but specifically an attack on black culture. With the CEO of Warner Music 300 Entertainment, which YSL is an imprint of, telling reporters outside the courthouse, if this were country music, rock music, we wouldn't be here. And Young Thug's defense lawyer arguing, yes, he speaks about killing 12, Atlanta slang for the police, and people being shot and drugs and drive-by shootings. This is the environment he grew up in. These are the people he knew. These are the stories he knew. These are the words that he rhymed. But there you have prosecutors arguing that the lyrics are more comparable to a killer's manifesto than a piece of art because they say YSL was more than just a record label. It was a gang. With the deputy district attorney saying, we didn't chase the lyrics to solve the murder, we chased the murder and found the lyrics. And there, apparently the judge agreed because he allowed 17 sets of lines from Young Thug
drug and other YSL artists to be used as evidence. And while these arguments are more serious, a lot of people online are fixated on kind of the almost comical moments. Like when you had the defense explaining that thug and young thug doesn't have any criminal connotations, but rather it's an acronym, T-H-U-G. It was his path that he could ever make it as a musical artist and help his family, himself, and his many others out of this endless cycle of hopelessness, he would be truly humble under God. That's what thug means. We're in discussing an Instagram photo in which young thug appears to be holding up a Bloods gang sign, making the letter B with his hand. The defense there countering that his fingers are actually pointed downward, so it's not a B, but a P, which they say refers to one of his songs, Push and P, and supposedly that doesn't mean pushing power or drugs, as many presume, but rather- It's called pushing P. And it's positivity. It means any circumstance you're in, if you think positively about something, you can make it through. You're pushing positivity. Then in another viral clip, a defense attorney goes on a bizarre tangent about anime. With her there seemingly trying to make an analogy to her client, who she says is just being lumped into the trial with Young Thug as filler. This reminds me of this anime named Bleach, where it's 16 seasons. Every season's 18 to 20 episodes. And they have season four and five, they have these bouts. They're the villains of the whole thing in season four and season five. The main characters are trying to get them out of soul society. You go to season six, you don't hear about the bouts. You go to season seven, you don't hear about the bouts. Why don't you hear about these important characters? Because they're filler characters. It's a filler season. Me and Rodalius, we're fillers. We're not integral to this story. And all of this, keep in mind, while we are only on day three of this trial, with many, many more months ahead. And oh, I, I forgot one of the weirdest things about the situation. This young thug case could actually have implications for the Georgia trial of Donald Trump. Because as it turns out, the Fulton County District Attorney prosecuting young thug, Fonnie Willis, is the same person going after Trump for attempting to overthrow the state's election results. And not only that, she's charging both men under the RICO statute, originally designed to dismantle organized crime groups like the mafia. Because notably, the law carries a looser standard of proof since the state doesn't have to prove that they knew about or ordered all of the crimes. Only that they were the head of an enterprise that carried them out. So the trial of Young Thug could actually serve as a test case for the DA's creative use of the RICO statute, and that may actually affect who is the next president of the United States. So, yeah, wild times. And then some people are going after this kid right now, Holden Armenta. And depending on where you go online right now, there are drastically different reactions to the situation. You got people divided. And it's all centered around Armenta attending the Chiefs game in Las Vegas over the weekend. And it's because during that game, a photo was taken of Holden showing the side of his face painted black, the headdress that he was wearing. And you had a reporter from Deadspin reporting on it and writing a story with the headline, the NFL needs to speak out against the Kansas City Chiefs fan in blackface native headdress. And in the article, the reporter Karen Phillips said, it takes a lot to disrespect two groups of people at once. But on Sunday afternoon in Las Vegas, a Kansas City Chiefs fan found a way to hate black people and the Native Americans at the same time. And while you had people reacting with shock and disgust, you also had a lot of people quick to share photos of Holden's entire face, showing that the other half was actually painted red and pushing back against Phillips. Though there, Phillips defended his piece, saying in a since-deleted tweet, for the idiots in my mentions who are treating this as some harmless act because the other side of his face was painted red, I could make the argument that it makes it even worse. Y'all are the ones that hate Mexicans but wear sombreros on Cinco. And you know, with that, others saying the paint on his face isn't great either. But at the same time, we've seen many, many people jumping to Holden's defense. Some saying he's just a kid and one responding to Phillips saying, this man ruins the life of some poor kid for the crime of wearing face paint at a football game and he really thinks he's the good guy. And then this whole situation also prompting Holden's mother, Shannon Armenta, to share a post on Facebook saying that Holden is Native American himself. And with that, there have also been reports that his grandfather actually sits on the board of the Chumash tribe in Santa Ynez, California, though reportedly when Heavy asked his parents to confirm that, Heavy said they declined to answer, saying instead they wanted to talk to their lawyer first. You know, it's Seeing the whole situation, I gotta pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts on this mess? And then, in the least surprising entertainment news of 2023, Taylor Swift has once again dominated the competition. But that's just one thing we learned this morning from Spotify Rap. You know that time of the year where Spotify goes, "Hey, let's uh, let's look in the mirror. Let's confront." your listening habits. Maybe you learn something about yourselves. Maybe you uh, get humiliated. Maybe you realize you're a basic bitch and you like what the rest of the world likes, which apparently for some reason is a bad thing. Oh, you like that immensely popular thing? How weird. It's like shaming people for liking vanilla ice cream. And what we saw this year is that vanilla ice cream got 26 billion streams. Or, you know, that's not fair. Taylor Swift's not vanilla ice cream. She's got, she's, she's done so many different things. She's more of like a, a Neapolitan, right? Or the ice cream you get at the supermarket that is like, hey, we got three flavors. And then you normally just kind of gravitate 
gravitate towards only one or two. But also, Taylor was followed by a ton of big names, including Bad Bunny, The Weeknd, Drake, and more. Also, as far as top global songs, we saw a bit of a mix where you had Flowers by Miley Cyrus leading the charge, followed by SZA's Kill Bill, and then As It Was by Harry Styles. Then top albums going to Bad Bunny, SZA, and Taylor Swift, who actually landed two albums in the top ten. And then, looking at the podcast charts, I mean, those look like you'd expect. For the fourth year in a row, Joe Rogan took the number one spot, with Rogan followed by Caller Daddy, Huberman Lab, and Anything Goes with Emma Chamberlain. Spotify there also patting itself on the back, noting that eight of the top 25 podcasts are owned and licensed by Spotify itself. Notably, in the podcast charts, Taylor Swift's influence was also somewhat there, with Travis Kelsey's podcast being the number one sports podcast globally this year. Though to give the boys some credit there, that had been spiking for a while. It just reached a whole different level after that whole big announcement. There were also some kind of like weird stats that came through. Like in May, searches for pickleball-related playlists went up 1,600% as the craze took off. The what is actually a part of a pickleball-related playlist that is a mystery to me. Though unsurprisingly, because of TikTok trends, there was that whole Roman Empire phase in September, which led to a 580% increase in searches related to the Roman Empire. 75% of the playlist there created by men, which I think does raise the question, is that like a chicken or the egg sort of situation? Because that trend was usually women asking their boyfriend or their husband, like, how many times a day do you think about the Roman Empire? And seemingly, from the search increase, there were a number of men that were like, I never think about the Roman Empire. Am I, am I supposed to? Shit, I got some catching up to do. But I will say, for me, uh, I did not jump on board the Roman Empire train. Instead, uh, I did that, you know, the classics. I got randomly into World War II history, plowed through j- the largest book I've ever listened to, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which I know for some, uh, a guy getting into World War II, red flag. Though possibly my bigger red flag is that I couldn't uh, celebrate Spotify rap this year. Instead, I got to look through my Apple Replay 2023. And then, you know, the holidays are here, and that can be like the busiest time of year for a lot of us. Not to mention, possibly the yummiest, but this year, I've got the confidence to stay on track with my workouts thanks to today's sponsor, Copilot. You know, my schedule is already changing with more things to do, places to go, foods to eat. And so I'm in constant contact with my coach through messaging or calls, which is partly why I have the confidence I do to stay on track. And I love Copilot because between the app and my coach, I feel supported in keeping my goals with flexibility and accountability. I mean, this is the first workout program that I've been able to stick with, and happily so. And with a guiding hand like Copilot, success has never been more attainable. And your first step is easy. You just start with an onboarding call connect to a coach, and then they make customized workouts tailored to your needs. So if you want to join me on a fitness journey of your own, just click my co-pilot link or scan the QR code to get a 14-day free trial with your own personal trainer. Because the biggest thing here is that the changes that you make today, right now, it can enhance your life in ways you never thought possible. And then, y'all, people are pissed at Sports Illustrated right now because they appear to have been caught red-handed in the AI cookie jar. Staff reportedly furious. Yesterday, Sports Illustrated also having an all-hands meeting that was described as contentious and tense by staff members. And so you had staff demand answers, executives dodging responsibility, you know, the usual things that happen when scandal strikes a company. And as far as like what the specifics of this are, Sports Illustrated published articles that supposedly were written by writers that didn't actually exist. Or because this week, a piece was published by Futurism in which they report that consumer product reviews published in Sports Illustrated were, at the very least, bylined by AI-generated authors. And pointing to several authors that outside of Sports Illustrated just don't seem to exist anywhere. In fact, the headshots from the biographies of the authors in question are even available for purchase on a site that sells AI-generated photos. Hell, sometimes AI generated authors would reportedly disappear from the site altogether only to be replaced by another with even the post supposedly written by one being attributed to another with no explanation about the byline change. And then when Futurism questioned the publisher of Sports Illustrated, the Arena Group, all of the AI generated authors just disappeared from the magazine site with no explanation and Sports Illustrated withdrew the stories in question. And following Futurism publishing their report, an Arena Group spokesperson provided a statement saying that the content in question was from a third party, Advon Commerce. And they're adding that their initial investigation found that the content was written by real people, but Advon use pseudonyms and pen names to, quote, protect author privacy, which Arena Group says they do not condone. Right, so they're saying that Advon created a fake author, gave them a fake name, a fake biography, used AI to generate a headshot for them, but definitely, for sure, use content written by real people. And that is a story that Sports Illustrated and the Arena Group are sticking to. With top executives Ross Levinson saying in an email sent to staff regarding the situation, the articles in question were product reviews and were licensed content from an external third-party company. Advon assured us that all of the articles in question were written and edited by humans. However, you have sources telling Futurism that's just a big old pile of bullshit. Claiming at the very least, some of the content is absolutely AI generated no matter what those in charge say. But also with this, Sports Illustrated executives told their staff in the all hands meeting yesterday that this was a one time mistake with Advon, with whom they said they've already broken off their relationship. But many staffers reportedly were still dissatisfied, saying that the executives were just passing the blame off to this third party rather than taking any accountability whatsoever.
whatsoever. And so following Futurism's report, we actually saw the Sports Illustrated Union putting out a statement saying, if true, these practices violate everything we believe in about journalism. We deplore being associated with something so disrespectful to our readers. We demand answers and transparency from Arena Group Management about what exactly has been published under the SI name. We demand that the company commit to adhering to basic journalistic standards, including not publishing computer-written stories by fake people. And we've also seen many individual writers expressing their displeasure. One staffer saying, along with basic principles of honesty, trust, journalistic ethics, etc., I take seriously the weight of a Sports Illustrated byline. It meant something to me long before I ever dreamed of working here. This report was horrifying to read. And another writer and editor shared the union statement, saying, The practices described in the story published today do real damage to the credibility of hardworking humans I have been honored to work with for the past nine years. And notably, you know, this wouldn't be the first time that an Arena Group publication has been caught using AI poorly. For example, back in February, Men's Health published an AI-generated article giving health advice that was found to be chock-full of errors and needed a massive correction. But ultimately, that's a situation, and, uh, you know, call me a cynic, but I, I think that the situation is only going to grow and grow. Right? Because when you give companies the ability to cut corners and try to save, especially while at the same time being able to scale your content, getting it out to more people, a lot of companies are going to jump on that bandwagon. But the long-term effect is going to be very interesting right? because there is another cost, and that is the possible cost of uh, public opinion, and that is a possible cost of trust. And it can take a lifetime to build a brand and a reputation and just a moment to ruin it, which has made all the worse when you consider that a lot of these big companies are filled with people that don't want some of these changes that are happening. And then we need to talk about your privacy right now because senators are actually moving to renew controversial foreign spy powers that have a major impact on Americans. Because the surveillance program in question is Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act or FISA. And under Section 702, government intelligence agencies are given the power to conduct targeted surveillance of foreign people outside the U.S. through the collection of emails, text messages, and other communications. With those communications compiled into a database that intelligence agencies are able to search without a warrant, and officials say that the data they have gathered has been used for important national security operations including stopping foreign plots to kill Americans in the U.S., preventing cyber attacks, and recovering ransom paid in ransomware attacks. And with all this, a senior administration official actually told the Washington Post that, quote, roughly two-thirds of the articles in the president's daily brief come from 702 information. But this is Section 702 has long faced widespread criticism from civil liberty advocates and privacy hawks because it allows the surveillance of foreign targets who are communicating with people in the U.S. And so as a result, intelligence agencies are able to search this database for evidence on Americans, including people in the U.S. legally and American companies. And then they can use that evidence and criminal investigations. And all, key thing, without ever obtaining a warrant. So with this, you have opponents arguing that agencies like the FBI will use these backdoor searches to collect evidence in domestic crimes that have absolutely nothing to do with national security or foreign threats. And in fact, we have evidence of the FBI doing just that. With court documents unsealed earlier this year revealing that the agency misused the Section 702 database more than 278,000 times just between 2020 and early 2021. And that including against victims of crimes and people arrested during the George Floyd protests. Now with that, the FBI says that they have since resolved all those abuses, chalking them up to, you know, just silly misunderstandings between agency employees and DOJ lawyers over how to use the database. But, you know, words are words, and that still hasn't stopped concerns for many people across the political spectrum, all of which has made the reauthorization of 702 a much more difficult political battle. Now, notably here, the bill to renew Section 702, which was introduced by the Democratic chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee and sponsored by two Republicans, does seek to address some of those concerns. For example, the legislation would ban the FBI from searching the database for evidence of a crime. Though there, there are exceptions for searches that can prevent loss of life, serious bodily injury, injury or a cyber attack on key infrastructure. But still, and this is the key thing here, it would not require intelligence agencies to obtain a warrant to search the database, which would obviously be a major win for those agencies. And they've argued that being required to get a warrant would muck up the works and slow them down too much. But this is you as civil liberty groups saying, you know, we need the warrants and everything like that in place to protect Americans. And so they've actually condemned the bill for not going far enough to address their concerns. And this including the senior policy counsel at the ACLU who told the Post, the plan isn't much of a reform because the vast majority of the backdoor searches that do occur are done for foreign intelligence purposes. Pretty much all the stories of abuse we've seen were for queries done from foreign intelligence purposes. And adding to the bill, quote, makes mostly cosmetic changes and doesn't actually get the underlying problems we've seen with Section 702. And then actually beyond that, you have other critics arguing that the bill actually expands Section 702 surveillance in certain ways, like by letting search subjects consent to searches. And notably, if this is renewed, it would be renewed through 2035, which is twice as long as past reauthorizations. But then also, notably, in addition to the opposition from civil liberty advocates, it also faces an uphill battle in the House. And that's largely because it's currently unclear how this will be received by Republican Representative Gymnasium Jordan. Right? He chairs a key House committee that oversees reauthorization. Right? And Jordan's actually a major privacy hawk and has previously suggested that Congress take the FBI out of the Section 702 process completely and indicated that he supports imposing warrant requirements. Requirements that very significantly the Biden administration has said it can't accept. And this is the right-wing House Freedom Caucus and other far-right members have signaled they will fight over any kind of FISA overhaul, especially if it relates to changing Section 702. And so I guess, long story short, it's, uh, it's all a mess. You have people who are often opposed on certain things, agree 
worrying in this way, but also sometimes for different reasons. <laughs> right now, no one really knows how this is going to play out. And then let's talk about yesterday today, of course, because we did yesterday's show. We covered a lot of news, and I think it's important we dive into those comments and see what y'all had to say. Yesterday, I saw y'all sounded off on things like the, the Tuberville weak military controversy. Sharing comments like, I'm an infantry veteran, U.S. Army, so I would like to speak on the subject of a, quote, weak military. I want everyone to understand we are not weak because of LGBTQ plus warriors. We have fallen behind, though. Saying our senior leaders are constantly caught in lies and scandals, hypocrisy, so they cannot be trusted to lead our forces. The DOD slash Pentagon is mismanaging money, which is significantly affected, at least from an infantry standpoint, our ability to seize and control terrain. Our vehicles break down on the way to the range, for example. We have a massive equipment problem and a mental health crisis. But saying despite these problems, we are intelligent and come up with workarounds. And with that, you had people also responding, and then you've got these soldiers living in squalor like Phil reported last month, with inspectors passing places that are totally unfit for humans to live in. Soldiers shouldn't have to deal with mold in their homes, especially in the U.S. Also, a bunch of you yesterday were having a conversation around the IOC controversy and scandal with lacrosse. Sharing comments like, as a native Canadian woman from the Wendat Nation, Iroquoian tribe, I'm hella proud of our sport. My cousin has an amazing business making lacrosse equipment by hand, and saying he credits lacrosse for helping him achieve sobriety and stay sober since he started playing, and adding the sport is so important to us. As is hockey, both sports were played by our tribe, and in fact, women were the only ones allowed to play when it came to conflict resolution. So saying, I personally suck at both sports. I'm an archer and former solo figure skater. I'm too anxious to play team sports. But I do love watching the sports and watching the young ones get really into it. But easily one of the biggest reactions were a lot of people going like, I had no idea regarding the history of lacrosse. Which, yeah, I agree. People saying, I've always thought of lacrosse as the rich private school kids sport. I have never heard of the Native American roots of the game, which makes me really sad as one of my good childhood friends was Native. And saying, I really got an appreciation of their culture and the way it's so commonly swept under the rug, even in 2023, is a bit mind-blowing. There was also a lot of conversation around the issues with Amazon and USPS. People saying, the fact that we have not improved our mailing service since the introduction of the highway system is a major contributing factor. I hate what Congress has done to USPS. At one point, USPS was going to be the service of the people by extending their service to offer things like email, banking, and other essential services that most businesses fail to offer in rural communities. When you tell me Amazon is harming rural communities because of Congress, of course this has been happening for decades now. Amazon just accelerated the problem. And another writing, as someone whose mother works in the USPS, hearing about the Amazon story connects so many dots. I can't count how many times I've spoken with my mom about work where she would finish her work in time but be forced to go back out and help her co-workers. It was always, quote, this route isn't finished, or person's name wasn't moving fast enough. Sometimes it would mean an extra hour, sometimes it meant four to five. And it doesn't matter the conditions either, 100 degrees and humid, a literal blizzard, it's no wonder they are so understaffed. And I will say uh, more and more of the comments about like how people are like, I can't believe this is a thing, I didn't know about this. I feel like, especially in 2024, I'm going to need to start uh, posting more individual clips, maybe on like a, a different channel like PBS News Clips, to make it easier for people to find those important stories, because I know sometimes, you know, things can get lost in a 30-minute show. But that is where today's show and your daily dive into the news is going to end. Though, for more news you need to know in day five of The Secret Project, I got you covered right here. You can click or tap to watch, or I got links in the description, of course. But, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you right back here tomorrow for more news.